The Beatles' musical influence is well known, but few people are aware of the influence that they had on music technology and the influence that music technology had on their music. Once the Beatles were signed by George Martin, they had access to the EMI Studios, as they were known at the time. The studio only changed its name to Abbey Road after the Beatles released the album of the same name. The studio still operates today under this name independently. The environment of EMI Studios was far different from the recording studio environments of today. In 1962, studios were operated more like factories than creative spaces. And whereas nowadays, one engineer would handle almost every element of the technical aspects of the album, back then there were very specific jobs assigned to different parts of the recording process. A tape op would be hired to simply work the tape machines and do nothing more than press buttons. Balance engineers are allowed to make adjustments to the musical balances and they would be allowed to move mics, but they would not be the ones to set them up and maintain them. Meanwhile, a technical engineer would be tasked with maintaining the equipment, setting up the mics, and changing any connections when they needed to be done. As you can imagine, this setup did not allow for very much creativity from the tech staff. To complicate matters further, EMI had very strict policies in place about what mic goes where on what instrument. If any employees were caught breaking these rules, it would certainly mean termination. There was, however, one major advantage that came from the studios being part of a larger organization. There was a dedicated research and development department. EMI had very high standards for their equipment, so much so that any new piece of equipment was subjected to thorough evaluation before being deemed suitable. Furthermore, products that were promising were subject to modifications by the R&D departments. As a result, the technical standards of EMI were very high for the time. As a testament to this equipment, the studio still owns and uses many of the microphones from that era, all of which still feature their original components according to the current Abbey Road website. Much of the remaining equipment is still owned and occasionally used at the studio as well. Recently, these tools became available to recording engineers through an arrangement with software giant Waves. A few years ago, they entered an agreement allowing the Waves engineers to do comprehensive tests on this legendary equipment and offer it for sale. It's worth mentioning that all of these products were originally intended for internal use at EMI only, so there are very few examples of each, making them some of the rarest, most expensive, and at the same time most coveted pieces of audio equipment in the world. The first important piece of equipment that we come to is the Red Desk. Probably the most easily recognizable piece of studio equipment would be these consoles. RED stands for Recording Engineer Development Departments. The EMI engineers built a few different versions of these consoles, and the Beatles used them throughout their careers, except for the Abbey Road album, when these consoles were retired for the Next Generation TG series. This, among other things, accounts for the drastic change in fidelity of the Beatles' final studio album. The studio still owns some of the red consoles, but it is known that at least one of them has been sold to Lenny Kravitz, who has been using it on many of his later releases. Vacuum tube technology was the predominant technology of the day and is responsible for a large part of the sound of that technology. In the red consoles, over 30 tubes were used. The next piece of equipment I'd like to talk about is the J37. At the time, tape was the dominant format for recording, and the Beatles saw the progression from single-track recording all the way through to eight-track recording. These limitations are quite impressive when you realize that by today's standards, Sgt. Pepper would require almost 100 tracks. The majority of the Beatles' work was done on the J37, and the software that is currently available was recreated from the very machine the Beatles used on Sgt. Pepper and the majority of the recordings that followed. It features a whopping 52 tubes. The next items I'd like to discuss are the RS series. The remainder of the products coming out of the R&D department were simply cataloged with a numbering system. RS stood for Recording Studio, which was followed by a three-digit number. The number simply represents the order the products were completed, and as such, they are not very helpful. Regardless, there are some standout pieces. A compressor is a device that modifies the dynamic range of a given instrument. The RS-124 was the workhorse compressor for EMI and was actually a heavily modified Alltech 436. It was actually modified so much that the R&D team opted to replace the faceplate 
Unfortunately, this is the one piece of EMI history that is not currently available in a software format. The RS-56 was an equalizer that was designed to assist in the process of making master discs, but the quality of the sound prompted the Beatles to lobby for, and get, the ability to use it in the recording and mixing process. In this design, there are no tubes. The other common compressor at Abbey Road was the Fairchild 660, which was actually deemed acceptable in its original format, so was not modified. This compressor is revered in the industry even today, with original units selling for tens of thousands of dollars. There are 20 tubes in these devices. The last device I'd like to talk about is more of a technique and less of a device. It was very common for the Beatles to record their lead vocals twice to thicken up the sound. They realized, however, that this took up a lot of time and was very difficult to do, so EMI engineer Ken Townsend figured out how to simulate this effect electronically. The process is called automatic double tracking and is now referred to as ADT. So now that we know some of the technology that was available to the Beatles, how did this affect their music? At first, the Beatles recorded their performances to a single track, which is quite a testament to their musical abilities. Once two tracks were available, they simply recorded without vocals and then added the vocals afterwards on the second track. The eventual availability of four tracks corresponded with, and in some ways influenced, their desire to experiment. Ironically, one of the first forays into technology came from the least technical Beatle, John. Working on demos in his home studio, he accidentally placed the tape on the recorder backwards, but loved the backwards sound so much he pushed to record backwards vocals onto Rain. From then on, he took an interest in how technology could create new sounds. As their desires grew, so too did the desire of their engineer at the time, Jeff Emmerich. He had grown tired of the restrictive policies of EMI and really wanted to experiment or quit. Luckily, the Beatles had enough clout to back him up. The Revolver album was a turning point not just for the Beatles, but for audio production itself. One of his earliest experiments was with Lennon's voice on Tomorrow Never Knows. By consulting with one of the technical engineers, he was able to rewire a Leslie cabinet, commonly used for Hammond organs, to feed a voice through. This eventually opened the door for guitars and many other sources to be fed through the device as well. There were also a few times when Beatles were influenced by the technology. One such instance came in a day in the life. During the bridge, you may notice that Paul rushes the rhythm of the line, and I went into a dream. This was actually done to allow the recording engineer a chance to get John's Oz onto the very same track a little bit later. Eventually, the Beatles outpaced EMI's ability and even willingness to keep up with their technical demands, which led to the creation of the Beatles' own studio. It was a technical disaster, however. Google Magic Alex for more information. And they eventually came back to Abbey Road to record the Abbey Road album, somewhat begrudgingly, as they were sick of the EMI policies. One of the great ironies is that despite the studio's joy at being immortalized by the biggest group in the world, they missed one key point about that album cover. The Beatles were definitely walking away from the studio. Our discussion starts on July 1st, 1963, almost six months exactly before the legendary appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. As the Beatles were preparing to record in Studio 2, Mal Evans, the group's roadie, headed to the canteen to get tea for the Beatles. He returned, breathlessly screaming, FANS! Lennon asked him what he was talking about, but before he could answer, a young girl burst through the studio doors making a beeline for Ringo. Their manager, Neil Aspinall, tackled the poor girl and carried her, sobbing, back out. A large group of girls that had been outside the studio had managed to overwhelm the guards and bust through the front door of EMI. It was said by those there that day that the scene resembled the Keystone Cops or similar to a chase scene from a Scooby-Doo cartoon. Once the intruder was escorted out, Studio 2 was barricaded so that the session could commence. Engineer Jeff Emmerich noted that the situation put the group in a very good mood and influenced the performance of She Loves You. Emmerich said, I still judge that single to be one of the most exciting records of the Beatles' entire career. Musically of note is the use of a major sixth vocal harmony in the introduction and at the very end of the song. At the time, the harmony was considered to be more of a jazz voicing a la Glenn Miller and not part of the pop vocabulary. 
Although George Martin actually had misgivings about the harmony, it remained in the arrangement and hinted at yet another of the Beatles' eclectic influences. In these days, Lennon and McCartney were still crafting songs together, so the individual contributions from each writer are a little harder to define. However, in the book John, Cynthia Lennon points out that the famous chorus bit line bears a striking resemblance to a Christmas card John sent her, which reads, I love you, yes, yes, yes. If I Fell is notable in that it does not have a typical pop form. The song is devoid of a proper chorus, and it features an introduction in a completely different key as the rest of the song. For the sake of comparison, please also note the simplicity of Paul's bass line. When it comes to bass, Paul has been quoted as saying, I wasn't keen to do it, but I had a really bad guitar. The heat in the club and the sweat made it fall apart. As a result, Paul's bass lines in the early days tend to be rather simplistic and basic, but that would change soon enough. On Friday, October 9, 1964, the Beatles embarked on a British tour that was to last until November 10th. As exhausting as touring can be, almost all of their days off were spent in the studio. On October 18th, the Beatles came in for their first of these sessions and completed eight days a week, which had been started on the 6th. In the remainder of the nine-hour session, they also completed Kansas City, Hey, 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 Mr. Moonlight, I Feel Fine, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, Rock and Roll Music, and Words of Love. The group's ability to work so quickly serves as a testament to their abilities as performers, but perhaps this is also why the energy level of She Loves You was never again quite matched. After a few years of constant touring and recording, the stresses started to take their toll on Lennon. He said, When help came out in 65, I was actually crying out for help. He even refers to this as his fat Elvis period due to the extra weight that he had put on, partially due to the regular pot use. We were smoking pot for breakfast. Perhaps this explains John forgetting the second verse during their performance on The Ed Sullivan Show. It is interesting to note that the version of Help that appears in the movie is not the same as the version that was released on record. For reasons unknown, John, Paul, and George re-recorded the vocals for the movie version, which also eliminated the tambourine from the recording. Paperback Writer has a pair of little-known firsts associated with it. First off, it is considered in some circles as the first music video. Although other music performances had been filmed, this was the first film to be sent out specifically for the purpose of promoting new music. Also of interest is that the companion track, Rain, was the first record with backwards recording on it. On the technical side, the session is the first documented use of using a speaker as a microphone to record Paul's bass. It's a technique that is still used by engineers today. Although deviation from the strict EMI recording policies would usually mean termination, Beatles engineer Jeff Emmerich figured the Beatles would have the clout to back him up. As a result, Revolver features some of the first recordings of a microphone inside of a bass drum. Again, this is a very common thing for engineers to do currently, but at the time it was very revolutionary. Strawberry Fields was the name of a children's home near where John lived growing up. He had fond memories of going there for parties as a child and always liked the name. But growing up, John says he felt like he saw things differently than many of his peers, which also led to him feeling isolated as well. No one I think is in my tree speaks to his feeling of isolation. Well, I mean it must be high or low is in reference to his conflicting feelings about being different. Strawberry Fields Forever was the first Beatles track that was recorded after making the decision to stop performing live and set the stage for a new era of studio experimentation. The Beatles spent many sessions working on the track and actually ended up recording two completely different versions of the song. The first was started on November 24, 1966. But now that the Beatles were no longer operating with any kind of deadlines, John decided that they had not achieved what he had in mind. As a result, a completely new version was started on December 8th in a different tempo and a different key from the first. However, it was not done yet, 
John eventually decided he preferred the first minute of the first version. Since they were at different tempos and keys, one version was sped up while the other was slowed down. Luckily, the keys and tempos still worked. Jeff Emmerich has said that it was common that when McCartney made small mistakes, they actually tended to turn them up in a mix and bring attention to them. In Fixing a Hole, I've always loved the quirk of the misplaced rhythm of the bass line after the line, Keeps My Mind from Wandering, happens. Here is the rhythm of the bass part for the chorus of the song. And here is what McCartney plays after that lyric. Was this intentional or a happy accident? Perhaps his mind was wandering. Either way, the change adds interest to the song and perhaps serves as a reminder that the Beatles are still human after all. Fixing a Hole is also notable as the very first EMI recording session the Beatles ever did outside of Abbey Road. The title of Good Morning, Good Morning came from the most mundane of sources. It was inspired by a TV commercial for Kellogg's Corn Flakes. But the most famous, or rather infamous, story around Good Morning, Good Morning happened at a session where nothing was recorded. John had been scheduled to come in and record background vocals for the song, but when he arrived at the studio, he was still in the middle of an LSD trip. He told George Martin he wasn't feeling well, and, assuming, and George, assuming he was simply sick, took him to the roof to get some air. When he told the band about this, they bolted to the roof to retrieve their friend because the roof of Studio 2 has no railings or ledge and John could have easily fallen to his death in his incapacitated state. The track ends with a collection of animal sounds that the engineers put together based on John's simple instruction. Each animal should be larger than the previous one. In line with the growing dysfunction in the band during the White Album, Ringo quit on August 22, 1968, and rejoined 12 days later on September 3, 1968. In his absence, sessions continued with Paul filling in on drums, and as a result, it is Paul playing drums on Dear Prudence. In this era, it was not uncommon for Paul to double his own bass lines with a baritone guitar, an instrument that is best described as a normal six-string guitar but tuned an octave down with thicker strings. By doubling the bass lines with this instrument, it simulates a studio effect that was commonly used by the Beach Boys called Tic Tac Bass, wherein they would have an electric picked bass double an upright bass. John Lennon's Come Together is actually a spectacular failure. The song was an attempt to write a campaign song for Timothy Leary's 1970 run against Ronald Reagan for California governor. John tried to write around the campaign slogan, Come Together, Join the Party, but failed to come up with anything appropriate. He did, however, come up with Come Together, which, unfortunately for Leary, was useless as a campaign song, but was a great opening track for Abbey Road. The track does have one foreboding element. Although obscured in the production, John is actually saying shoot me in the introduction, foreshadowing John's death a little more than a decade later. Because was inspired by Lennon listening to Yoko play Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata at home, and then asking her to play the chord progression in reverse. Although not an exact reversal of the progression, it is easy to hear the influence of Moonlight Sonata. As a further twisting of the classical influence, the Beatles used a rare instrument, the Baldwin Solid Body Harpsichord. The instrument is best explained as an acoustic harpsichord with guitar pickups installed that fed a guitar amplifier. Because is the only Beatles track that this instrument ever appeared on, until Paul bought the instrument from Abbey Road in the 70s and brought it back out to use on John's real love in the 1995 anthology project. As a testament to their musicianship, the tight three-part harmonies were recorded all at the same time around one microphone and repeated two additional times. Oh Darling was Paul's nod to 50s rock and roll. Although not a complex song, Paul was very picky about getting exactly the performance he wanted. To achieve the loose and raw tone he wanted, he came into the studio numerous times to give the lead vocal a chance, 
If it didn't work, he'd simply move on to whatever else was going on that day and try again later. Eventually, Paul recorded a few satisfactory takes and composited them together. Sometime later, Lennon was quoted as saying that he really liked this song and wishes he would have sung it. I always thought I could have done it better. It was more my style than his. Unfortunately, the growing divide between the two men prevented Paul from reaching out to his old friend, and vice versa. Although the tension between John and Paul has historically received the most attention, there were actually tensions between all of the Beatles. Around this time, George was finally starting to assert himself as a songwriter and was growing tired of being ordered around by Paul. Engineer Jeff Emmerich recalls, I couldn't help but notice that Harrison was actually giving Paul direction on how to play the bass, telling him repeatedly that he wanted the part greatly simplified. We now know how well Paul took that instruction. The resulting bass line is easily one of McCartney's most complex and melodic bass lines in the entire Beatles catalog. The ending medley on the second side of Abbey Road is best known for the only drum solo Ringo ever played on record, although he didn't actually record it as you hear it. It was edited together from a longer improvisation. Something that is not as well known is that the trading guitar solo at the end of the track represents the last time that Paul, George, and John recorded together at the same time. Perhaps because they realized that this would be the last time, the session was very lighthearted and the three men enjoyed playing together for the first time in a long time. On January 4th, 1970, George, Paul, and his wife Linda met at Abbey Road to record the background ooze on Let It Be. With the exception of Phil Spector's Let It Be orchestral treatments, which the band had no creative input on, this was to be the last official Beatles session. <laughs> 